Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. we gather for contemporary worship. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our first scripture reading comes from 1 Thessalonians, from the first chapter, starting with the second verse. Part of the greeting to this letter, Paul is giving thanks for the church's faithfulness. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The gospel reading comes from Luke, from the sixth chapter, starting with the 27th verse, which is part of the Sermon on the Plain, and comes immediately after the Beatitudes. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Well, it feels strange being up here. I've been among the group here and at the 8.30 service, by the way, for you 11 o'clock people. Uh, for, gee, it's been almost a year, I think. For a while, I wasn't able to come every Sunday. Finally, it's getting so that I can. So it feels good to not only be up here uh, and preaching, but be a part of this group in a way. Uh, by the way, what you hear in my accent is uh, Michigan. Grew up there and went to school. There we go. There we go. A little bit of New York City. I spent some time there. And then a lot of time in Texas. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. The Houston area, if you're, if you're interested. Um, and I am a United Methodist pastor, retired, uh, had uh, retired, and I did something that um, I saw a lot of bumper stickers in, in Texas when I was there. The bumper stickers said, um, I'm not a native Texan, but I came as soon as I could. <laughs> and uh, that's the way I feel about Albuquerque, in a way. I, I really love Albuquerque. I, I I looked around for some place to retire. I didn't want to stay in Houston. I hate the weather there. And, um, and uh, looked around and fell in love with Albuquerque when I visited. I 
wanted a little bit of winter, but not too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, as I say, I, I started coming to Mesa View, oh, uh, just about a year ago, uh, and first Sunday, I was very impressed with, first of all, the greeting. Your greeting to newcomers is just absolutely marvelous, and thank you for that. And then I heard a really good sermon, and I appreciated that, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's something else that I found out about this congregation almost as soon as I came, and that was you were just about to vote on being a reconciling congregation, and you did, and congratulations. Uh, that is such an achievement. I understand you're the only one in uh, New Mexico. I belong to the Texas Conference, by the way, as a pastor. And uh, by the way, there are five conferences in Texas, Texas Conference just being one of them. And uh, and big one is 800 churches in uh, about uh, in in Texas Conference, and uh, there is exactly one reconciling congregation in those 800 churches. And I'm sorry to say I was never the pastor of that church and never got it to the point where I could get my congregations to, that I serve to become reconciling. But I really congratulate you on that achievement here. It's truly a good one. But this message today is based on um, relationships. In relationship, it's uh, good part of this, this series of, of messages that you have, and I, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, there's, uh, well, let me, let me ask something of you folks before I get going on the message. How many of you are either introverts or extroverts? <laughs> let, me, let me ask extroverts first. They like to raise their hand. <laughs> yes, <me>. Okay. <laughs> And then you introverts, go ahead, come on. <laughs> That's me. That's me too. Um, yeah, it's 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 one of those things that each of us are going to receive the message differently, and that's going to be one big part of it, uh, whether we are an introvert or an extrovert, because as we talk about relationships, that's a big part of that. Um, I've done some thinking about this, obviously, because I'm going to preach on it. I've decided something. Um, I've decided God is an extrovert. No, God's laughing at me, but you know, I can't help that. But what do you think about it? For, for, uh, first of all, we know God's a, a constant presence, right? Always around us. That's extrovert if I ever heard it. Uh, he, God's involved in everything we do. We know that. And, and, and wants to hear from us. I mean, we're admonished all the time to pray constantly or else build our, our relationship with God in such a way that we are in touch with God all the time. My favorite example of that is, I can't say his name, maybe some of you know it, the, the, the father, he's the, the star of Fiddler on the Roof. What's his Tevya. Tevya. That's it. Tevya. Remember that first scene in Fiddler on the Roof where he's going about doing his business, working in the, in the, um, uh, in the yard that he has and, and going into where the stables are and his animals are and everything, and he's talking with God. I mean, just talking like, like you would talk to your neighbor or, or to, your, to your spouse. Uh, it's, it was just automatic. You could tell that that was how he stayed in touch with God and was in touch with God all the time. That's what God is asking us to do uh, in a very real sense. Th that brings me to another question. And, and that is, have you ever wondered why God created us? I mean, think about it. There's that whole universe to deal with and, and all the issues that come up with running a universe and, and here's God creating us who has, this has to be a problem for God 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. But I tell you, thinking about this, I go to a poem that that um, is just one of my favorite ones. It's by uh, uh, a man named James Weldon Johnson, and it's called uh, "The Creation." If any of you know it, you know what I'm talking about. It, the, the scene, the, the, the poem starts with God looking around and saying, I'm lonely. I think I'll create a world. And, and, and after God made the, the sun and, and the moon and the stars and, 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 the, and, and, and the animals and, and all the living things, uh, he looked around and said, you know, I'm lonely still. And so what he did was sit down by the river and scoop up a handful of clay and make a man. God's lonely without us. I know it's, it's putting a lot of, of assumptions on, on who God is, but that's pretty good, don't you think? To think of it that way, that God's lonely. But I think it's true that relationships with us is very important to God. In fact, if we're wanting to build relationships ourselves, there's no better way than to begin by developing a relationship with God. It's, it's the certain path we know to all loving relationships. This month's series of sermons has been wonderful in, in, in setting this whole uh, message up, my message on relationships. If you, if you take a look at all the, the different things on there, every single one of them has to do with relationship. Every single one. Of course, relationship has everything, single one, something to do with every one of the else, too. So, in other words, here we are needing to build relationships in order to take a look at what we have as Christians. And of course, God's made it a little easy for us. Made it easy to build relationships with God because God came to us as Jesus just to show us what it's like to have the good relationships, the loving relationships, and the understanding of what it is to be human but also to be imitators of God. So, all we have to do is copy Jesus. <laughs> Become Christ-like is the way the Bible says. Easy, huh? Not. <laughs> not, not at all. I have a story to tell you. It's about one of my failures as a pastor. It happened uh, the very day that we call 9-11. And I know you all remember that day, if you were still here, or were, are old enough to be here, there. It was a horrible, horrible day. It was one, though, that you know, life was going on, and, and, and everyone had responsibilities to meet. And, and so I went on with my responsibilities. And one of them was, for me, I felt as though I needed to call on one of my church members who was recovering from a stay in the hospital. So that afternoon, I, I was talking with him. And of course, there's only one subject that day. And we talked about that day, and he said, yes, those sinners in New York City are being punished. And my immediate reaction was, oh, not by God, <laughs> not by the God I believe. And he was furious. He just exploded in my face, just so angry at me because I doubted his faith. I've relived that time again, and of course, he asked me to leave, or not asked, told me. And I did, I wasn't, he was just coming from the hospital, I wasn't about to argue with him. But I've relived that time again and again and again, wondering what I could have done or what I, how I could have 
opened up the discussion in a way where we could be understanding of each other and still, you know, be able to uh, talk about it at least. I've never really resolved that, I must admit. But one thing I do know is that I hadn't really worked on my relationship with him before. I knew that. I didn't know his theology. I didn't know his understanding of God. And I hadn't really listened to the underlying message that he was giving that day. I just didn't hear him. I just reacted and brought down the fist of my pastorhood onto his head. And that's been something that I've been thinking about. Well, that happened, goodness, almost 20 years ago, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I've come up with a few things that I work on when I try and build a relationship. And I'll give you the list. One is, first of all, I share. I share with the person I'm, I'm talking to. I give something of myself. I, I, I look for something with us that is uh, mutual so that there, there is something there that we can, uh, sh we can share as well as, as be sharing. And I try very de desperately now to really, really listen. Actively listen. And that means that not only do I listen to what that person is saying, but I respond. I, 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 the word that it comes to me is parrot back to him. He says, I'm feeling ill. And I say, oh, you're not so feeling so well today, huh? So he knows I heard him. I try and empathize. That's the third thing I try and do. I'm always reminded of the time, there's a, there's a and I didn't look it up, I should have, but there's a, there's a paragraph in, in, in the Gospels where Jesus is, uh, sees a, a mother grieving for a dead son, and he has compassion upon her. And I know that word is one that is, can be translated as, as empathizing, empathizes with her. To empathize with the person. And then if I can find a way to, to support someone in something. Uh, John, uh, your reverend, gave a wonderful example of that last week when he says, Jesus even invites you to be supported by Jesus. Take my yoke upon you. It's being supported by Jesus. And then sometimes the only thing you can do is just be present with someone. And I think that's what I should have done with this man that was recovering from his, his hospital stay. That, that means, you know, you may not have the words to say, uh, and that's true, especially if you don't know the person well, but you're there. Renita Weems is, do you know her? Someone? I know her writing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, she, you, you, maybe you know the book that she wrote called um, Listening for God. By the way, she's, she's an ordained pastor, and she's a, a teacher at the Vanderbilt uh, University uh, Divinity School. And she wrote a book uh, about listening for God. And in it, she has, has one chapter or one portion uh, dedicated to her experience with a stranger. And I just want to read this to you. Uh, this has to do with, you know, part of relationship is relating to strangers. She says, I was in a nice, quiet, lounging area of an airport waiting for my next flight. I opened up my computer journal to kill some, kill some time between flights and to record a few thoughts I had in my mind. 
The woman sitting next to me is talking to someone on her cell phone and begins to cry. I keep typing, pretending to be absorbed in my thoughts, although I'm misspelling every word. Okay, she's off the phone. She wipes her nose. She glances nervously over at me out of the corner of her eye. I don't look up. Should I intrude on her grief or not? What is the difference between privacy and solitude? A woman across from us leaves her seat, comes and hands her a packet of tissues and nods knowingly and warmly, and then goes back to her seat. I finally ask, are you all right? I couldn't help overhearing you crying. She doesn't say much, just that her mother's surgery hadn't gone as she hoped. She thanks me for asking. We sit in silence for a while, then she gets up and walks to one of the bistro tables and sits and dabs her eyes. I sit, feeling sort of clumsy. I finally got the nerve to say something and nothing miraculous has happened to reward my speaking up to this stranger. I thought I'd feel better for reaching out, but I remember hearing a pastor once saying from the pulpit that some of the most lasting changes take place underground, like a, a seed planted. In time, mysteriously, quietly, slowly, change happens to that seed, and it grows. And I know that pastor who spoke those words was me. Being in relationship with friends is, is difficult enough, especially for introverts, <laughs> let alone strangers. Of course, I'm talking as an introvert, but let's carry it a step farther. Think back to today's gospel lesson. Jesus is saying we need to treat our enemies the same way we treat our friends, the same way we treat ourselves or expect to be treated. Now, confession time. I have a neighbor that I don't like. He doesn't like the way my dog barks at hot air balloons. <laughs> he doesn't like the way I park in my driveway. I park backwards. He doesn't like my new fence with the beautiful climbing roses on it, and it is not on his side. <laughs> now, I admit this is not much of an enemy, but I find it very difficult to be civil to him when he's complaining, let alone love him. <laughs> and then I hear God, love him, not his actions, God? What do you mean? But God, uh, all I know are his actions. Are you sure you want me to love him? I know, I know. My plan to build a relationship with my Kerbunjan church member can work here too. Let's see. I can listen more actively and, and respond in a way that I know he has heard what he is really trying to say. I can share the positive things that we have in common. I know that. I can empathize with his feelings concerning the issues he sees as problems between us and others. I can do that. Okay, God, I get it. He's also your child and you love him. I'll work on it. I believe God created this universe, including us, so God was, had something to love to relate to. And God's love and presence is boundless. The overriding goal of Jesus was to be at one with God, which by the way is John Wesley's definition of perfection, at oneness with God. 
our journey through life as Christians is to have that same overriding goal. What better way to work on relationships with others than to respond to everything through love? That's not only God's wish, but God's way. Let's do the same. Amen.